What's up, guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of Part of the Problem. I am Dave Smith. He is Robbie the Fire Bernstein. How you feeling today, brother? Um, uh, it, you know, it, it, it gets weird. Home for 10 minutes and then we're already back out. I am looking forward to Casper, Wyoming, though. I am very much looking forward to Casper. Uh, we will be there this Friday and Saturday. Yeah, we were just talking about before uh, before we started the show, but both me and you have pretty crazy schedules uh, coming up. I'm basically through November. I'm um, just a ton of traveling, a ton of podcasts, a ton of stand up shows. Um, and then I, I get a nice little break uh, in December. But uh, yeah, it's it's really crazy, man. Um, because obviously we like we do stand up comedy. So we have a lot of stand up comedy gigs uh, booked. And then of course, with with this show and the stuff we do on politics, it's like, we are really in the season i mean it's a uh, it's only a few weeks away we're it's september 3rd as we're recording this today i was reading earlier today that early voting starts this week like there are people who will be i don't know who it is is like military people maybe get to like cast their ballots first or whatever um like absentee ballot type corpses deals. take a while to make their decisions the, the dead people well they're going to be voting for months they got they got a lot of time um but it is it, it's strange because th for the last, say, 15 years in America, um, it, the presidential campaigns have been going longer and longer. Um, they they start earlier. There just is a longer election period where they're campaigning. And then, of course, this year in like the most. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess the last two were so it's almost like you hit like this, this critical mass where you're like, I don't know if the stakes can be raised on this anymore. I don't know if everyone can dial it up more. But if they can, they have. I mean, this election has been just insane. And yet the result of it is like the shortest election and that really we we just found out a few weeks ago that the Democratic nominee was going to be Kamala Harris. We really only found out for 100 percent certainty two weeks ago. And yet here we are, you know, it's like on, on our last episode, we were sitting here talking all about how Kamala Harris finally gave her first interview. And then you sit here and you're like, oh, and we're only a few weeks out from the election. And it does seem to me, if you just kind of zoom out and try to have, you know, like just some analysis of where we are right now, I'd say it, it seems like there is no good outcome for the country. And I don't mean like, I'm not trying to be like black belt or anything like that. I'm not saying like the long run is we're all screwed. I don't, I don't believe that I'm, I'm not a pessimist. Um, but in terms of just this election, you've just, I, I think you've got a situation where um, if Kamala Harris wins the election, or perhaps I should say, if it is announced that Kamala Harris won the election, I, I don't know about you, Rob, but I, the percentage of Trump supporters that are going to believe this was a legitimate election are uh, single digits, I'd say. I, I mean, I, I literally think it's going to be uh, the overwhelming majority of Trump supporters will believe this election is stolen if Kamala Harris wins it. And I, it's kind of hard to blame them from my perspective. Kind of hard to blame them for feeling that way because it, it's like there's that, do you, you remember that uh, the Time Magazine article about the 2020 race? I forget the title of it, but it was about how they basically stole it and plain, in, or they rigged the thing in plain sight. Um, it, especially now, Look, th there were reasons in the year 2020, and and let me say this, okay, uh, completely aside from any allegations of actually stealing the election, like completely outside of any accusations against voting machines or or ballot harvesting or like any of the, you know, there were some videos that were pretty sketchy that came out from the 2020 election where like they're covering the windows and stuff like that, but all of that stuff aside, what you had throughout the year of 2020 was um, the entire uh, U.S. economy was shut down. Now, a lot more than that, obviously, the, much of the global economy. But you really had like the United States of America 
the economy was shut down, something totally unprecedented. And this happens in a re-election year. Um, it is obviously there were a lot of Republican governors who were, did this as well, but it certainly was at least uh, cast as more of the Democratic governors really pushing it with New York and Los Angeles and these kind of being the like the centers of uh, uh, of Democratic voting bases. And this is where they were the most outspoken um, on the side of shutting the whole economy down. You then had um, the biggest, most sustained riots of my lifetime um, in terms of like they swept major cities across the country, billions of dollars in property damage. Dozens of people were were murdered um, and hundreds, if not thousands of of pretty vicious assaults. Um, and this is cheered on by the Democratic establishment and the corporate media. You have throughout the whole year, you have this mass censorship campaign where anybody who is critical of the lockdowns and the riots, um, they are at risk of being censored. You then had the what is just objectively, and everyone admits it at this point, the Hunter Biden laptop story in October, which is suppressed in a way that no story has ever been suppressed before, where you have um, the the New York Post, one of the top 10 biggest newspapers in the country, their Twitter account is suspended. The link is unshareable. Uh, of course, at this point, um, Zuckerberg now has admitted that they censored the story on Facebook and admitted that it was based off FBI lies. The FBI came and told him it was Russian misinformation when it wasn't. Um, it, just given all that, and I could go into more detail about that, I mean, you, you also can't leave out the fact that for the previous four years, their president had been framed for treason, which came out as a big lie. And hence this idea that Donald Trump was some Russian agent. It was all so ridiculous to begin with. But anyway, you give you take all of that and then your guy loses the election. E even if you don't, you know, even if it's not true that they flipped votes, you know, I liked Glenn Greenwald's uh, Glenn Greenwald's framing of it where he said basically, yeah, they didn't steal it, but they rigged it. You could understand why anyone, if you were on, a, if you were a Trump supporter, you'd leave that feeling like, yeah, they robbed us. They did not give us a fair shot. Okay, well, take that and multiply it by a hundred. I mean, that's that's how they're going to feel about this election, and and you can't really blame them. I mean, like as I've as I've mentioned many times on the show before, I'm completely agnostic about. Um, uh, election legitimacy. Like, I don't know. I don't really trust what governments tell me. I don't, I don't know. They're able to pull off a lot of lies. Maybe they could pull this one off too. Um, but, you know, going into this year, there's just no way that any, I, I don't even say, forget even Trump supporters. I think, I don't see how any honest observer would look at this if Donald Trump loses and not go like, yeah, I mean, obviously they rigged the whole thing against him. All right, guys, let's take a moment and thank our sponsor for today's show, which is Enterra. Unlock the secret to youthful skin with Enterra Skincare. It's a peptide revolution. In the quest for youthful, radiant skin, Enterra Skincare unveils the secret ingredient, peptides. Their scientifically formulated products are infused with powerful peptides, the building blocks of skin's natural resilience. Peptides dive deep into your skin, simulating collagen production, reducing wrinkles, and restoring firmness. Whether you're combating the early signs of aging or nurturing mature skin, Enterra's peptide-rich formulas cater to all skin types. Experience the transformative power of peptides. With Enterra, you're not just nourishing your skin, you're unlocking its youthful potential. Join the peptide revolution. Embrace the future of skincare with Enterra. EnterraSkincare.com slash problem. That's where you got to go. And make sure to use the promo code problem for a 10% discount. That's E-N-T-E-R-A skincare.com slash problem. Make sure to use the promo code problem for 10% off. All right, let's get back into the show. No, but I mean, if you just think about like this time going into it, it's like, OK, they weaponized the justice system against him, charged him up and down with all types of crimes. They intentionally did it for them to all fall on the campaign year. 
right? Like, as we've, we've talked about before, like, even if you think Donald Trump was guilty of some crime related to October, uh, or excuse me, I do this a lot, related to January 6th, um, you know, all those other guys got charged for those crimes in 2021. So why is Donald Trump getting charged in 2024? Why did it happen to be that his Stormy Daniels uh, hush money trial happened in 2024? The election interference thing happens in 2024. The defamation suit happens in 2024. Like all of these things came down in very clearly intentionally on the year he was uh, campaigning for president to drain his time and resources and divert them somewhere else. And also to give the talking point you know, that is used by every single Democratic uh, uh, politician, uh, surrogate, campaign advisor. Every Democrat is going to say over and over again, he's a convicted felon, blah, 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 right? Um, so you have that. You then have, I don't know, trying to put this, I'm trying to put this in the most uh, plain but undeniable way. You then have, the Secret Service allowing a guy with a rifle to get less than 150 yards against Donald Trump and get a clean shot off, at least one clean shot off, at his head. You then have a straight-up coup where they, oh, they Donald Trump's about to win, clearly. And so, rather than accept, well, it looks like Donald Trump's just going to win— um, and, you know, we had a primary and the president of the United States says he's not dropping out. Instead of just letting that election happen, they literally cooed the sitting president of the United States out of, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe coup is not exactly the technical term um, because it's like he's still the president. They didn't exactly overthrow him, but they forced him out of his reelection, which is pretty clearly how it went down. And then on top of that, we've almost certainly got one or two more crazy things that are going to happen between now and then. So when this happens, nobody's going to accept it uh, on the Trump side. And, I mean, if Donald Trump is able to pull this off and he's able to win, well, we've already had a taste of how much the left half of America is going to lose their freaking minds about that. And I don't know about you, Rob, but I have not seen any indication that they're going to handle it better this time. I, I, I think it's going to be pretty, I think it's going to be pretty rough. And it, by the way, it should also get pointed out that the entire democratic establishment and voting base did not accept the election results of 2016. And they carried on for years claiming that it was Vladimir Putin who had overthrown our democracy and installed Donald Trump. The most, it, it, it is funny. Look, you can make the argument, by the way, that it's, which many uh, people do, but you can make the argument that it's not exactly the same thing. Um, and fair enough, it's not exactly. One of the things that uh, Democrats love to point out is that Hillary Clinton did concede that she had lost, but, but Donald Trump didn't concede. Now, Hillary Clinton did not give a concession speech that night, which is typical, she reportedly got drunk and furious and was breaking glasses in her hotel room. But the next morning, she did come out and give a concession speech. Um, now, you can you can argue that these things are different. You can argue that January 6th, uh, you know, is was whatever, an attempt to stop the certification of the voter. Look, all those arguments aside, I'm just saying, number one, that Democratic voters in their heart did not accept that the election was legitimate. And number two... The, the claim from Trump supporters that this whole thing was stolen from Donald Trump is 100,000 times more reasonable and plausible than the claim in 2016 that Vladimir Putin had overthrown our democracy, which was just straight up invented. Like, there's just not even a shred of truth to it. There's not, I mean, not only was it, there's not a shred of truth, the, the, it's not even like overthrown our democracy. They they found like a few hundred dollars in bots that were purchased by a guy who once had dinner with Vladimir Putin. That's like the, the closest they have to it. So the, anyway, my point is just that the in the in the middle of this kind of white hot culture war, 
that there is no resolution to that that's possible through the results of this election. So that's one thing we know for sure. We're still going to be right there. I had no idea Hillary Clinton was that rock and roll. That would <laughs> that would have me on board. She tra- I how did I never hear that story? She really she trashed a hotel room? Uh I got to you know, I'll I'll have to find the source on this. Um it's 100% this was written. I don't know with 100% certainty that it's true, but yeah, this was evidently like a few people on the campaign and that's I, I, I want to say it's Bob Woodward, but I'm starting to think it may, it may not be him. I'd have to double check who the source on that is or one of the one of the listeners will do it before I can. But yeah, that was the that was the the allegation. You she see, was drunk and furious. I have Up there a, with Bill, Bill just sitting in the corner. Like, I hate when she gets like this. <laughs> I have a little bit of a suspicion that the Democrats might take it a little bit more gracefully this time if uh, Trump wins. Uh, and the reason I think that is because we saw the way that they had to kind of adjust when it became reality of the fact that Joe Biden had dementia and they finally kind of settled into the loss of that. Uh, I wonder if with Donald Trump winning a second time, they finally go like the last time they bogged him down and they said, hey, he's a Russian asset and they didn't allow him to do any of his agenda. And that worked really well. And then, you know, the second we've heard all the anti Donald Trump storylines. I just wonder, I, I guess sometimes I can't even see how they spin it or lie about it. To, I, I mean, what, what how do you claim he's just representing the racist? Do you still get to play that card? It, like, I, I almost can't see what their storyline is other than to go, all right, he won. Let's see what he's actually going to do. Yeah, well, it does seem to me um, that and we've talked about this a bit. I've talked about this a bit on other shows, but it does seem like Donald Trump it, like this isn't the 2016 Donald Trump. And. I, you know, I, I got to say, we'll get into a little bit of this later, but I think he's running a terrible campaign at this point. I mean, it's just like it, it, it's just really it not it doesn't have any of the magic. Of, well, J.D. Of the Vance is a stinker and he's kind of uh, I, I, I wouldn't call him flip flopping, but he's not like aggressively going with any very sexy storylines. It's not that I'm going to take down the deep state. It's not the, hey, here's how I'm going to fix it. I'm going to get this out of these wars. It's a lot of Israel needs our full support. Um, It's a lot of uh, the vaccine was great, and you guys should be thankful to me for it. There's just, there's not enough like gusto on the important stuff. Well, that's right. And it's always, as I've been saying now for, for months, it's always at the, or not always, but at least at these very key moments, he's casting himself as the defender of the establishment. It's just just like, oh man, like has no one told you that the whole appeal of you was that you're not that? (laughs) Um, No, look, man, I mean, as you bring it up, the the J.D. Vance pick at this point is just looking like, I, I guess the best thing you can say for him is that, oh, Trump was thinking of picking Marco Rubio. And ultimately was persuaded to pick this guy. It's like, okay, he's better than Marco Rubio. I, I got to say, um, you know, like obviously I've, I've made my feelings on this very clear that my hope was he would pick Vivek Ramaswamy. Um, now you could kind of say that, well, maybe Vivek would be better if he was put in a position with some actual teeth in it. Um, okay. But, you know, he hasn't been elected yet. And from what I'm seeing, I'm just like, I don't know. Vivek was just so much better than J.D. Vance. And it's not just that he's like closer on some issues that I agree with him on. I mean, obviously, that's part of it. And I'm sure that influences my thinking to some degree. But I just mean that like like Vivek is able to like it when if Vivek's in an interview, he can like he like kills it. He very consistently like he'll be asked a thing. And you're like, yo, he just like was excellent. Like he really like had a, a great compelling answer for every question that was asked to him. I just haven't seen anything like that at a JD Vance. Um, and then Donald Trump will just almost as if he is, uh, uh, at, at certain points, it seems like he's either attempting to lose or he's attempting to kind of be like, uh, you know, like, um, when a golden retriever like lays down and shows you his belly, 
just to make sure you're like, no, you're the dominant one here. I know I'm not a threat. I'm like, it's like almost like that's what he's trying to do. I mean, like that's when Elon Musk was asking him about his thoughts on the secret service. That's what it felt like to me. Like he was just going like, guys, please do not blow my brains out. I, I have nothing but good things to say to you uh, about you. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Let me take a second to tell you guys a little bit about therapy and BetterHelp. I will just say, personally, I have benefited tremendously from therapy in the past, and I know many friends of mine who have as well. A lot of people have misconceptions about therapy. They think that it's going to be these long conversations about why your dad didn't hug you enough or something like that. A lot of times, therapy is just helping you deal with obstacles that are in your way so you can achieve your goals in life. And if you're thinking, if you're even considering about giving therapy a shot, the easiest way to do that is with BetterHelp. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire and you get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Rediscover your curiosity with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash problem today to get 10% off your first month. That's B-E-T-T-E-R. H-E-L-P dot com slash problem for 10% off your first month. All right, let's get back into the show. Um, you know what? Let's actually, let's go to the Trump with Mark Levine video, by the way, on, on, the, uh, on the subject of what I was talking about here. Donald Trump sat down uh, for an interview with Mark Levine uh, what was a couple days ago. It was kind of overshadowed by the fact that Kamala Harris did her first and only interview. Of course, Donald Trump did a much longer interview, um, but this clip was just wild to me. Let's play that. Gone. It'll be gone. Israel is under tremendous pressure right now. It's amazing. If you go back 15 years or even less, the strongest lobby in that sense in the United States was Israel. You couldn't say a thing about Israel Christian or Jew, you couldn't say anything about today. It's like under siege. You look at AOC plus three, you look at these people, the way they talk about it. And then you see Schumer, who's become a Palestinian, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, he's actually become like a Hamas agent. <laughs> Schumer, how did that happen? Let me, let you me ask it. you about that. You see yeah, that. let's pause it for a second. I'll come back to it because there's already so much there. Um, we'll, we'll come back to the video in a second, but let, just to break this down, I mean, it's like every time, and I, I don't know, by the way, if, if anyone else can relate to this struggle, right? But throughout this whole campaign, and as ever, everybody knows who watches this show, I've been a sharp critic of Donald Trump since Trump burst onto the political scene. Um, there, I mean, <laughs> there's just so much to say, but every time I almost get pushed during this election like there'll just be one thing after another it's like okay like you know joe biden at, at first is running and it's like joe biden just deserves to lose so much and i god damn i hate joe biden so much i mean i hate joe biden for things he did in the 80s still to this day but as a president i mean just like the the covid vaccine pushing that on everybody all based on lies when no young healthy person ever needed to take the damn thing um, it, just insane. His, his responsibility for the catastrophe in Ukraine is he probably is the single most responsible person for that between his time as vice president and his time as president is just hundreds of thousands of people dead when there was like a million off ramps and he intentionally refused to get off at any point provoking the thing the whole way. Um, and then weaponizing the justice system against Donald Trump, it's just, it, they really did violate a, an American political norm in the most egregious way. Um, so you're like, he just deserves to lose. He deserves to lose so much. And then like the libertarian uh, nominee just like stinks. So it's like, yeah, there's no like other real third party that I'm considering voting for. And you just get to a point where you're like, oh, all right, um, maybe I gotta just support Donald Trump. Like, maybe I should just be like, ah, it is like, you know what? All the goddamn Trump supporters want me to do it. And, you know, it. I do kind of feel, I am kind of rooting for him in a way. And I really do think the Democrats need to lose. But every time, every time, like clockwork, when I even think about, maybe I should just throw my support behind Donald Trump. 
he'll come out and remind me why I shouldn't. There's one thing I can always count on Donald Trump for. Because like this, it, you know, I remember I used to say back in uh, like 2016, so there, maybe it was early 2017, but this is like when the allegations of Donald Trump being a Russian agent first started like to be popularized. I remember saying, there's so many things you can say about this guy, you know? Like, there's so many legitimate criticisms of Donald Trump. And yet you guys have picked the most absurd, ridiculous, clearly untrue thing to criticize him for. You remember, you remember how stupid that was? The idea that anyone was supposed to believe that Donald Trump, of all people, the guy who's been famous forever, the guy who my entire life has been a famous mogul, that this guy was a Russian agent all along? It's just made no sense whatsoever. It was obviously all a big lie. And you remember how fucking stupid it is that anyone fell for that? Yeah, okay. What could be stupider than that? I don't know. Maybe that Chuck Schumer's a Palestinian. Maybe that's actually dumber. The idea that Chuck Schumer is an agent of Hamas? Like, how fucking retarded? Who, how could that ever ring true with anyone except for, like, your dumbest Fox News watching uncle? Like, the dumbest one would actually look at that on Mark Levine and say, yep, they just broke that down. These Muslims infiltrated and took over the Jewish senator, lifelong Zionist, Chuck Schumer. Go, go look at any aid to Israel bill ever and look how Chuck Schumer has voted. Okay? Is that, is that not enough? Is, it, is, is funding and arming Israel not enough to make you not a member of Hamas? It's just so stupid. And then for him to be sitting here, is Donald Trump, like, how can you even, like, I, I don't know what to say, dude. If you were trying to throw the election or you were just trying to instill that I couldn't possibly support you, you're trying to ensure that I, no matter how much I wanted to, I could not come over and support Donald Trump. Is there anything you could say better than, you know, you used to not be allowed to criticize Israel? We used to ruin everybody's life who would do that. And then now we're just letting people do it. You know, this lobby representing a foreign government used to ruin the life of American citizens who would dare criticize this foreign government, who's on American welfare, by the way. But we've got this system locked up where you're not even allowed to express that you disagree with that government or we will ruin you. But they don't do it like that anymore. <laughs> we got to go back to those good old days when you weren't allowed to criticize a foreign government. I mean, what the, like, what a, for, not only is it like politically stupid, it's such an evil, un American position to have. It is totally, I mean, just like obviously on its face, 100% incompatible with the idea of being America first with the idea of being anti-war, with the idea of being pro-free speech. All of those are completely at odds with saying we had a powerful lobby that would squash all dissent against a foreign government. Think about how insane that is. So there's Donald Trump's position. Deep all state right. censorship used to be much better on the Israel <laughs> thing. No one said a word. I, oh, it, and he's it, also... It's, it's such a... Because even if you were pro-Israel... This is the worst way to pitch it. Uh, yeah. Look at how much the culture has changed that you can even get away with criticizing it. The machine used to be so much better and have so much more control over people's lives on this topic. So, I, I mean, now you're, I mean, you're, you're pitching the left authoritarianism of, mm -hmm. hey, I got to get back in there to make sure that we've got full control over, uh, uh, you know, topics like this because no one should be criticizing it. And, and you know, it, it's also just that Trump is so fucking stupid that he actually doesn't know. I, this has always been the major problem with Donald Trump. And it, it's so funny because it, everybody projects their thing onto Donald Trump. Everybody's got like, it, he's such a fascinating figure because he's just, first of all, he's so unique. He's so different than any other human being you've ever known. He doesn't look or dress or talk 
or do his hair like any other human being or do his bronzer. Like everything's just different. Um, but then he has this like effect where like the, the left wingers project this like Hitlerian figure onto him, which is just like the Russian agent stuff. It's all stupid. It's totally, uh, it's, it's totally untethered from reality. It's just something that they've like made up in their heads or been instructed to make up in their heads. And then the Trump supporters do the opposite. I mean, they cast him. He's the champion of the working people and everything he did wrong is because someone duped him or tricked him and none, but all, none of that's real. And Donald Trump, re what he is, is really just what you see in front of you. That's actually the depth of it. And that's it. And his major problem is now what it has always been, which is that he doesn't know anything. I mean, literally knows nothing. The guy has never read a book about any topic. Like, not one. There's not, there's not a conflict that he's ever talked about. There's not a policy that he's ever talked about where he has read one book on that subject. So he just knows nothing. And you're counting on that guy to be the guy for the tiny little task of draining the swamp. For this, he has the small task of rolling back the most entrenched, powerful corruption in the history of the world. But he doesn't know anything about anything. So, like, even when Donald Trump's talking about this, what, what Donald Trump knows, right, is that, uh, oh, people are criticizing Israel a lot more than they ever used to. That's what he knows. What he knows is what he's watched on Sean Hannity's show. Like, people are talking shit about Israel. They sure didn't. And so he concludes from that that APAC used to be a lot more powerful because he knows there's a big, powerful Israel lobby, and he knows now people are criticizing Israel. So he's like, oh, APAC used to be a lot more powerful. But that's not what's going on at all. APAC is more powerful today than it's ever been. Uh, go measure it. They spend more money on campaigns than they've ever spent before. They, they have uh, m more power than they had. What has happened, right? Because all you got to do is think about it like this. Has the di that dynamic that uh, Trump's talking about, which is true, that a lot more people are criticizing Israel these days than ever before. Well, is that true in the corporate media? Is it true that there's been a drastic change at the New York Times or at CNN about the way they cover Israel? No. They're doing exactly the same thing they always did. What's changed? Oh yeah, there's this whole internet thing now. You don't have you don't have a monopoly on information anymore. Where you're getting the truth about Israel is largely from the internet. That's where you're going to get these things. I mean, look, it's even like and, and I'm not even talking about like me or some of the other like people who are like critics of Israel, but I'm saying like John Mearsheimer, you know, if you want to read his books, you know, or go watch his lectures, you find them on the internet. You don't, you don't find them on MSNBC. It's not like, they're not inviting him on to break down all of these things. Um, and so that's the difference. But if you think about this, Donald Trump, this is how, how fucking retarded he is, is that it's like, so what are you saying here, Trump? You're on the side of, we should go back to the model where there was a monopoly on the flow of information where the corporate media and the Israel lobby could work together to stomp out all like critics of Israel. Cause you know, that old model is the same one that's that would keep you out. Like you tweeted your way to the presidency. The entire corporate media hates your guts. It's part of the reason why most left-wingers think you're freaking Adolf Hitler is because the corporate media told them so. So now you've positioned yourself, again, just like these other issues, you've positioned yourself as the defender of the old order, the defender of the establishment. Well, if anyone wants the old order, if anyone wants the establishment, you know what they don't want? Donald fucking Trump. All those people hate your guts. So on top of this just being horrible, like it's a, I, I don't know what else to say. It is a genuinely awful evil thing for a leader on the most profound level to say that you, my people ought to be subjugated, like that my, my people used to not be allowed to speak their minds freely about a foreign government 
And I want to go back to those days, which like, okay, he didn't explicitly say that, but it was pretty clearly implied, right? It was pretty clearly saying it's a bad thing that we've come to this point where we can't, where we can criticize Israel now. And I guess that makes you like a Hamas. It's like, okay, so why is it? Why is it that so many people are criticizing Israel today? Is it because APAC has been weakened? No, no, dummy. It's because of what Israel is doing. It's because people can go on social media, people can listen to shows on the internet, and they can hear the other side of the argument. And then, oh, by the way, on that same app on their phone where they can hear the other side of the argument, they can also watch the videos of babies being suffocated to death by the thousands tens of thousands probably maybe that has something to do with it and then it's like you're gonna you know you're gonna criticize aoc and the squad and and these people it's like what on the one issue that they're good on on the one issue that they've kind of got right that this war is horrifically immoral and we ought not be funding it Ugh, god it's just awful the whole thing is just so freaking stupid um all right let's play more of it there's a tremendous in streets. Yep, that wasn't happening when you were president. But it didn't happen when did I was not, president. But you signed an executive order extending the Civil Rights Act to cover Jewish students sure. and their free speech, which Jew Jewish students are using now to defend themselves in these Ivy League colleges. You see what's going on on the streets. Do you think this administration, you know, they give a speech here and there. Uh, do you think they've done enough? to fight this because colleges are opening now and they're saying it's going to happen again and it's going to get worse and people are running for their lives and they're hiding and so forth. When you see that, what do you think? Well, it's getting worse. I just see Cornell is is a hotbed right now. Today, all of the what's happening up there. So right now, it's a little bit early, but as colleges are starting to open, Cornell was the occasion. It looks like it's worse than ever. And they don't respect this administration. It's very simple. You know, the power that you have with all of the endowments and everything else, the big tax breaks that they get, you have tremendous powers. But the heads of these schools seem like either they're weak and pathetic or they're sort of Marxists themselves, fascist Marxists. Uh, one of the uh, people, one of the professors was on from Cornell today, and he was talking about how the head people at the school are almost encouraging the students to destroy the place. It was actually an amazing statement. You think, you know, I could see them cowering in a corner, but I can't see that they're actually uh, helping it. And it's shocking when you look at Columbia from last year, but it looks like it's going to get very bad, actually. It looks like it's going to get very bad. It's a little bit early yet. The season's just beginning. Schools are starting to open up. They haven't, most of them haven't opened yet, but the ones that have, it's nasty. It's nasty. And the government does nothing about it. Would you consider federal funds that go into these schools? Yeah. You have tremendous power over those schools. It seems to me we, we, we blackmail institutions all the time with federal funds. The Democrats do, too, but not here. They just seem to have wide berth to go for it. Well, also speech. I mean, you're not allowed to, if, if you're Jewish and talking about a positive Jewish event, or whoever you may be, or if you're conservative even, you can't, they won't let you speak. So I wrote out an order, a very strong order, and everybody- Okay, wait, wait, pause there. Um, I just, you know, I, I know I've talked about this before. That's, we're done with this, uh, with this video. But it's like, you, look, obviously there's a huge problem with universities in America today. Um, but of all the things to start going down this path, you just completely lose me I'm going. So, so that's, that's where the, the Republican ticket is, is that we should get the government more involved in the speech at universities that what we, we should blackmail them with federal funds. And I, you know, I got to say, I made this point um, back on a, on Candace Owens show um, the first time I was on, I think it was the first time I was on, where it's, you know, there is something, um, and, you know, me and you are both Jews, so, you know, I'm saying even from my perspective, 
there you go. Um, Jews are like 2% of the population. Um, the vast majority of them are liberal. Um, you know, there's not like, there's not that many Jews that are voting for Donald Trump. Um, I, I just mean in raw numbers, in terms of like your base, is it's a very small percentage of your base that's Jewish. Um, obviously, he has some. There's some Orthodox Jews who are are conservative. There's some Zionist Jews who like the type of stuff that he's saying here. Um, but these college campuses have been, let's just say, pretty hostile toward straight white men for quite a while. And that never, even though that is your base, that never warranted any serious conversation about threatening them with federal funds. And yet what? Because because there are protests against an ongoing mass slaughter campaign in Gaza, that's when we have to step in and threaten them. And isn't it like, Rob, like we've been saying from the very beginning of this conflict, way, way before the beginning of this conflict, but it is amazing how all of these like re Republican conservative leaders uh, thought leaders and all the way up to Donald Trump, the most, you know, influential leader of the modern conservative movement or whatever it is. Um, e all of them can just rail against the woke left. I mean, man, have all of these guys just made so much money, gotten so many clicks, increased their own, you know, uh, um, profile, by railing against the woke left until Israel's brought up and then they are identical to the woke left. Identical. Oh my God, there's been racism on college campuses and therefore the government needs to step in and take action. Think about the poor Jewish students. Like, the poor Jewish students. And what are we talking about here? We're not talking about criminal activity because we already have a pretty easy remedy for that. We're not saying like, oh, if a Jewish student was assaulted or something like that, it's like, okay, so call the cops then. That's, yeah, that should be a crime. And oh, luckily it already is. We're talking about what? We're talking about Jewish students being uncomfortable, like being uncomfortable that someone's protesting what the Israeli government is doing with our money and weapons. Uh, okay. Since when, since when are people who aren't woke leftists supposed to give a shit about college kids' feelings. Like, yeah, okay, maybe that makes you a little bit uncomfortable. You know who's really uncomfortable right now? The people of Gaza. They're really uncomfortable. And I'm just, I'm a slightly more concerned about their feelings than I am about these. You know, I was doing, uh, I did one of the, um, the debates on Israel, because I've done so many at this point, but I debated this guy, uh, um, Mark Pellegrino, who was just, he look, he did a very bad job, but it is what it is. Um, but he said at one point, and I always find this funny, it always comes up when it's the war in Israel and, and Gaza. Uh, he At one point he said to me, he goes, uh, he goes, think about the PTSD that the IDF uh, soldiers are going to have as a result of this war. And he was like, do you know what that does to you when you're like dropping bombs on all these civilians? <laughs> He actually that's, invoked that. Like real, he actually went that's think real about abusive dad shit. I mean, like yo, like I couldn't believe it, and I was like, well, yeah. I mean, like, but it's not even. By the way, it's not even that he's he's technically wrong. I mean, yeah, he probably is right. I mean, I I don't know. I, I know we had a whole epidemic of PTSD after the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, like, yeah, I'm sure it might be real hard for some of those soldiers to come back home and live the rest of their lives knowing what they've done. But like, that's your first thought. That's your first, like, you got, like, a, a guy murdering a bunch of babies, and then you go, like, yeah, but think about how hard that's going to be on his conscience. That's, like, that's going to be real tough to live with, being a baby killer for the rest of your life. But it is something like that, where it's like, what, look, man, I, look, it kind of sucks, I'm sure, if you're a Jewish student and people are protesting Israel and maybe the, the atmosphere is a little hostile toward Jews. I'm not saying none of that exists. I'm just saying, like, it's been... What are we on? 11 months, right? It's September. This war started last October. We're going on 11 months. I guess next week will be 11 months of this war. For 11 months, Gaza has just been decimated. And yet 
my sympathy, if I think about this conflict, is supposed to first and foremost not be on the clear victims of the conflict, but rather to be for the college students who are made to feel uncomfortable because someone else is protesting it. And like all these guys, Trump and Levine and Ben Shapiro and like all of these guys, it, it, Jordan Peterson, all, all of them, if there was, if somebody were making an argument that made the black uh, college kids or the gay college kids or the lesbian college kids or the transgender college kids, if someone was, was making an argument that made them feel uncomfortable and then you were to say they shouldn't be allowed to say that because this makes this group of people feel uncomfortable, they would be the first to laugh in your face, call you a little snowflake and be like, that's not how real life works, sweetheart. Sorry, this is higher education. And if you can't handle some ideas, then you go cry in your safe space. But we're all going to have this conversation, except when it comes to Israel. When it comes to Israel, that is the great exception where now we get to embrace all of the woke, uh, all of the woke standards. It's just something. There's two things that come to mind while watching this is one, uh, they feel like two tired old men. And yep. while the topic matter is interesting because they're talking about going fully authoritarian and clamping down on free speech and taking away funding from colleges to try and force their opinion on colleges. So that that becomes interesting. You're like, but I'm just saying the actual listening to them is you have to actually really listen and go, oh, wait, that sounds really terrible. The two of them themselves are kind of old and boring. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, I, I'm not saying it's good for the country. Politics probably should be boring. But that certainly isn't how Donald Trump won the last time is by being this absolutely just neutered and tempered in an interview. That's no, and one. that's part of the reason yeah. why they hated him. It's part of the reason right. why they hated him so much is that he excited people. They don't like that. They don't right. like people getting excited. Uh, the other thing is, and you know, it's easy, particularly because we live in areas where we're around more liberals and usually the liberals have the upper hand. And so we're feeling them kind of press on us such as removing free speech from the internet, forcing us to take vaccines, uh, stupid woke policies in your school. Like, it's just usually more often than not, we see liberals have the upper hand, and so it's easy to look at the conservatives as almost the underdog and go, oh, look, they're just talking about restoring freedom. Oh, look, they're talking about a value I care about, which is freedom of speech. But then you see the real conservatives, which is the second they get the upper hand, they'll, for they'll force you on a war. They'll, they'll take away your free speech and criticizing war. Yeah, you might get they might get enough of the upper hand where all of a sudden they start talking about, you know, you get your church ladies back out there going, hey, I don't like this filth on the Internet. But you, you, the second you see them get a little slice of power, you see they're the exact same thing. And, yeah. and that's why you, you got to speak to principles. And, and that's why, you know, and, and what you were talking about before, sometimes you get excited about supporting these people. It's because you get suckered in by this underdog thing where you're like, no, Donald Trump is being censored. Look, the entire deep state's against yeah. Donald Trump. He's the guy that's going to oppose them. But then you hear him talk like this and you see, no, that that's not what they're in this for. Yeah, man. It's like whoever who in my mind, it's like whoever's talking, the other side is winning. It's <laughs> like if you just shut up and just let me listen to Kamala Harris, I'd that's the closest to getting me to support Donald Trump. Um, you know, there's something uh, which which I do think, you know, now that I'm old uh, and, uh, you know, not old, but old for young people, uh, I'm 41. But one of the things that's kind of interesting is you get a little bit more of a perspective where I don't know if younger people are able to have this perspective because everything just like, like if you're young today, social media, if you're 20, social media is just part of life. Like that's one of the things we have in the same way that for us as kids, TV was just part of like, yeah, you have TV. Have you heard about like how your grandpa didn't have a TV? It'd be kind of like, man, there was a time before TV. All right. That's crazy. But your existence has not, but like, like I very vividly remember a time before social media. Uh, I have been doing stand-up comedy long enough. I've been doing stand-up comedy for 18 years now, believe. Um, when I started, stand-up comedians didn't have social media. Like it was a unique thing if one had one. 
Then right around when I was like a couple years in comedy, people started getting MySpace accounts. And then like some people would be like, you should start a MySpace because like it's good if you're going to be a comedian, you should have like a social media account. And that even seemed kind of weird. And then people were like, no, Dane Cook is like selling a ton of tickets because of his MySpace account. And this is back then, Facebook was just for college kids. And there was no such thing as Twitter. There was no, there weren't any of these other, uh, uh, you know, apps. Um, I just say that to point out how relatively new a thing social media was in 2016. I'm not, I'm fast forwarding a little bit here about 10 years between what I'm talking about when I started comedy in 2016, but it's only 10 years old. And it, and it was growing every single year. So it got to a point in 2016 where there was like, this was totally different. There's a totally different thing now that like in a presidential campaign, you didn't need the traditional media in the same way you used to because you could speak right to your voters. You didn't have to necessarily go on CNN. And also you could tweet something if you're a presidential candidate like Donald Trump, and then CNN had to talk about what you tweeted all day. So you could control the news cycle from your phone. This is a brand new thing that didn't exist before. And one of the things that rose up with uh, with social media was like troll culture. And look, troll culture has positives and negatives to it. Uh, there's, uh, you know, it's, it's entertaining. Um, it can also be useful. It can also dumb down the conversation. Like there's, there's good and bad with it, but young people got really into it. There's something about like, if you go on social media and you see trolls, there's something about it. That's the, it's, it's a very young and very male culture. Not to say there aren't women who are trolls too, but generally speaking, it's a very young and a very male culture. Um, and Donald Trump was kind of like the political version of a troll. You know, like he just, and when I say he's a troll, I just mean things like when, like when Hillary Clinton would say, it's a good thing no one with your temperament is president of the United States. And he goes, cause you'd be in jail. That, that just like captured the same energy that the, there's a reason why today, if Hillary Clinton posts something on, on Twitter, the replies are turned off because you know, that all of the replies are just that, just another version of that. Sometimes a more, a nastier version of that, but always just a version of like, you know, she'll just be like, we need to take measures to restore the American economy. And then like right underneath it, somebody's like, didn't you and your husband murder a bunch of people? You know, like it's just all that. Um, and so Donald Trump in a weird way, and maybe not even knowingly or intentionally, but in 2016, he kind of became one with Pepe the Frog. You know, like he was the embodiment of that culture, which was very young. It's like what the young people at that time were doing. And then on top of that, what was he campaigning on? in 2016. Well, it was like, we never should have fought the war in Iraq. We shouldn't fight any of these stupid wars in the Middle East. We shouldn't have open borders. We shouldn't have, we get ripped off on trade. The, by the way, all of Washington DC is corrupt and the corporate media are all a bunch of liars. They're all a bunch of liars. That was his campaign. And all of that together, it just captured this energy, like the dissident energy. Like if you, if you, if you say Fuck the system, who are you voting for? in 2016 for Donald Trump, because he's the f the system candidate. And now you fast forward to 2024, the establishment has failed even more. There's even more f the system energy. And also the person you're running against is just the system. There actually is no person who you're running against. There is not a candidate on the other side. There is only the system. Kamala Harris might as well be AI. She doesn't really exist. So what, I mean, she does exist, but what does she exist in? A f five minutes of an interview the other day that she bombs at? It's all AstroTurf. It's all fake. You're running against the system. And now in this environment, Donald Trump is not wise enough or does not have anyone around him who's wise enough to tell him that your path to victory here is to run against the system again. If there's a huge protest, I mean, just think about this. There's a huge protest movement on college campuses that is also saying, fuck the system. 
And what they're saying about the system is they're saying, fuck the system that insists that we have to fund and arm what they see as a genocide in you in in Gaza, which is, which debatably is. Um, and so they're like, oh, fuck the system. And by the way, who's the president of the United States of America? Well, as they would call him genocide, Joe, that's what the that's what the protesters are calling the guy who was your opponent until six weeks ago. They call him genocide, Joe. And so, Donald Trump, your instinct here is to come and signal against those kids on behalf of the system to say, why can't the system work the way it used to where we would shut these college kids up? Like, are, are you not just smart enough to at least go, oh, I should be playing those forces off of the Democrats? Instead of just bashing them and saying, I'll, I'll take out your problem, Kamala Harris. By the way, Kamala Harris was getting protests at her events a couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago, she was getting protested by this guy. There were protests outside of the DNC when she gave her uh, acceptance speech. Okay? Then Donald Trump is going, I'll squash them for you. I'll squash your biggest political headache for you. Rather than going, look, even all your people hate you for supporting this policy. Look, even Democrats are acknowledging how terrible this is. And Donald Trump, he doesn't even have to be, he doesn't have to be me. He doesn't have to be like a, a critic of Israel. But if he wants to capture any of this energy, he would have to at least not be just a blind defender of the establishment, which is just awful. I think it's a it's a stinker like the vaccine that seems yep. to be in the Donald Trump blind spot. So what he could do is he could he could do a Donald Trump lie here and say, hey, I know how to fix it. The problems I ran. And once I go and I oppose Iran, I weaker their, their power in the region. Hamas is going to know that they don't have any support. And let me tell you, they're going to give back the hostages. And then we're going to deal with uh, how, it, you know, how we can fix the whole region. I'm going to bring peace to the Middle East. Is any of that true? No. But at least that, that sells in a talking in a soundbite. You can go out and go, what's happening in Gaza is absolutely terrible. Never would have happened when I was in power. I know how to fix the Middle East. There's a power imbalance with Iran. We're going to get rid of that power imbalance. Hamas is going to be afraid. They're going to get back the hostages. We'll have peace. Is that true? No. Sounds fine, though. But instead, it's the same as the vaccine thing where he's so convinced, what I did, it was the best. Yep. I, I No one else could have got it. So he, he, for some reason on this one, and maybe it's because of the donor class and who he's, who he's around or who's hanging out at Mar-a-Lago or otherwise. But he seems to think that, like, the old school full support, you got to say, hey, I pledge allegiance to Israel, is what's favorable. And so, hey, I'm going it, to – it's what you always talk about, the aces. He sees this as aces. He thinks he's going to yeah. pick it up and everyone else has lost touch with the nation, that they're criticizing Israel. And what you need to be able to do is go, no, it's an American value that we support Israel – and right now, it's the most important time to support them. I think this is a blind spot for him where he, like, it's the same as the vaccine. He actually thinks that this is, that this sells. And it just, I, 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 this, I mean, the torched Kennedy's campaign. I don't yeah. know how this is going to play on a debate stage. You know, you're just, you're totally giving up the, hey, I'm opposing the deep state. I stand for not having censorship. I stand for America first. What happened to America first? Hey, we're going to build a wall and we're going to start caring about you. And now you're having a conversation about what's going on in the Middle East and we need to have more support for Israel. It just undermines literally all of the things that gave you oomph in the last campaign. Yeah, 100%. That 100%. And look, man, I'm sorry, but Donald Trump, at, like Donald Trump needs to really ask himself the question that Hillary Clinton so obnoxiously asked out loud in 2016, when she said, you might wonder, why am I not up by 50 points? And of course, when Hillary Clinton asked the question, she said, why am I not up by 50 points? She answered her own question, at least to everybody watching. You, it was like, well, that's why, because you're you. That's essentially why, because you're so awful that as much as um, as much as America, large swaths of America hated Donald Trump, they hated you so much that they wanted to fucking watch you lose to Donald Trump. That's why. Now, if 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 Donald Trump were to ask himself that question right now, which probably all Trump supporters should be asking, why isn't Donald Trump up by fifty points? He's running against Kamala Harris. 
How is he not dominating her in every single poll? You don't have to look any further than what Rob just said. It's, it, it was all right there in front of him how to run on it. And he could even couch it in language or, or stuff that maybe me or you wouldn't say, but he could either say, he could even say, look, we, we love Israel. We love Israel. They're a great country, great people. We'll always protect them. We'll make sure that nobody else can ever hurt Israel. But what they're doing in Gaza isn't right. And we're not going to fund that. We got too many problems here. What I'm focused on is closing the border, getting your jobs, getting good health care, getting all that's it. If he was running on that, he would be he would be winning by a substantial margin. I, I completely believe that. That and and also because look, he could just say like he could he could couch it in America first in free speech. America has a right to care about Americans. We're we're in thirty five trillion dollars in debt. We can't afford to fund other countries' wars. And our and and uh, in America, by your birthright, you're allowed to speak your mind. You're allowed to say what you believe. Period. That's what Americans are entitled to. I mean, you can't tell me that's not a winning message. All right, guys, let's take a moment and thank our sponsor for today's show, which is Monetary Metals, an incredible company that is revolutionizing the precious metal space. Right now, you can unlock a 12% return on silver. Silver isn't just a precious metal, of course. It's a tangible asset and a great way to diversify any investment portfolio. But with Monetary Metals, you don't just own physical silver. You own silver that works for you to generate more silver, growing your total ounces over time. And right now, you can get 12% annual interest on silver, paid in silver, in their latest offering if you're an accredited investor. Click the link in the episode description to learn more or just head over to monetary-metals.com. Monetary Metals is revolutionizing the way you invest in gold and silver. They've been paying interest in silver and gold for over eight years, helping you grow your wealth in real time tangible assets. Finally, there's a true alternative to saving in dollars, a yield on gold and silver with monetary metals. Once again, click the link in the episode description to learn more about the first true silver bond since 1834, or go to monetary-metals.com right now. All right, let's get back into the show. By the way, real quick before we we wrap this up, let's just uh, let's play that Nancy Pelosi uh, clip. Because, by the way, this is another thing of, like, if you want to know, what should Donald Trump run on? Here's what Donald Trump should run on. This should be every single Donald Trump uh, uh, campaign ad right here. The California lawmakers just passed a law. I, it hasn't been signed by Governor Newsom. But giving um, government assistance to undocumented immigrants to buy houses. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a, a different place than uh, the Democratic Party used to be on immigration. Is it not? I'm not going to say that's what the country is going to do, but that's certainly where California is. Well, I, let me just say, immigration had always been a bipartisan issue. I refer you to but the... But not free housing. Well, it's not free housing. It's it's American dream being available to more people. But understand this about immigration. The best speech on immigration was by... President Ronald Reagan. This is the last speech I will make as President of the United States. I want to communicate a message to, to the country I love. And he talked about the Statue of Liberty and the bat, uh, beacon of hope it is to the world and what America was preeminent in the world because our door was always open and we will cease to be preeminent when we shut the door. Now, that's I don't do justice to the great communicator. Google it. It's a fabulous speech. And George Herbert Walker Bush continued in that respect for the diversity of America and the rest. Uh, California is always in the lead. Maybe others will follow that lead, but that's up to those states. But we are very blessed here with beautiful diversity. Do you you'd vote for this law? Excuse me? So you'd vote for this law? Well, I don't, I, I'm not familiar with oh. exactly what that is, but making the, uh, the American dream of home ownership available to all people is something we have to do for people before who are here now. This is before, before you receive this. Hmm? This is undocumented. Hmm? This is for the undocumented. Well, what I would like to do is move them to documented. The fact that we can move them to documented. And all right, you can, you can turn this off. That we can so do. that's a uh, see now I kind of want to vote for Trump again. <laughs> see, that's all. <laughs> Well, it's like, um, 
I mean, like that right there. That, and look, say, save all this stuff. Ronald Reagan gave a great speech. It's like, yeah, okay, 45 years ago, we were in a very different situation. We didn't have the border crisis that we have today. I mean, whatever. Um, but isn't it just to say that? Yeah, it's like, what's your plan with the undocumented workers? Like, make them documented. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, that is one way to solve the problem in the same way that um, if you got a problem with the crime of murder, you could say the solution is to legalize murder. Now you don't have a crime anymore, but that's not really, you know, that's not. And then, of course, the whole conversation is over. Which this, by the way, I find really interesting to this. Uh, um, and I know we got to wrap up, so I'll, I'll try to make this brief. But first of all, the American dream being equated with home ownership is such a scheme by the big banks. It's been something they've been really pushing for 30 years, but that that's somehow you're supposed to. The American dream was always historically about coming to a prosperous, free country and giving your kids a better life than they would have had back home in the old country. That was kind of like the American dream. The American dream was that you could make it here. You could be the author of your own story. And if you worked hard and you had talent, you could make it. The idea that the American dream was equated with home ownership is something that like it, it, it was like something that J.P. Morgan Chase came up with in 1994. You know what I mean? Like that, that's, there's no and I, as, as somebody who owns a home, I own a home for one reason and one reason only. And that's because I want I don't want my kids to have to move around a lot in their childhood. I wanted to, I wanted to give them one home where they grow up for their whole childhood because I moved around a lot as a kid, and I, I don't think that's the best. Um, aside from that, if you're childless, I'm not sure it's so obvious that you should be buying a home. I mean, like, even if the value appreciates, like, go look at how much you got to pay back compared to what you borrow. It's not necessarily such a great deal. Um but regardless, we're talking about now the government giving you a free home. Since when has that ever been the American dream? The American dream is a handout from the taxpayers? That's the dream? That you could be in a home that you know you didn't earn yourself? They got, And then just the idea that not only are you supporting it, you're supporting legalizing illegal immigration, but that also that, hey, Mr. Taxpayer, you know the guy who wants to build the wall? Not only do you not get that wall, not only are we making illegal immigration legal, but you got to buy him a house. Oh, I know you can't afford a house, but you got to buy this other guy a house. I mean, that's that's what Donald Trump should be running on. He's got it all right here. Not this sucking up to APAC nonsense. Nancy right. Pelosi wants to buy illegal immigrants homes. Yeah, th that's it. There's your campaign. All right, guys, uh, we're going to wrap there. Thank you for listening. Catch you uh, tomorrow and, with a brand new episode. Peace. And if I, if I can plug a couple of dates. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Time Sorry. this up, we'll probably have them up. Uh, but just added a whole bunch of porches. First one, September 21st, out in Detroit. Then September 22nd, Salt Lake City. And then Jacksonville, October 5th. And Miami, October 6th. And then more dates coming at you. Hell, yeah. All right, thanks for watching, guys. Catch you next time.